Hello and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we're going to be considering the theme of science across the novella The Strange Case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. Before I dig any deeper into this text I want to encourage you to join my tribe and hit subscribe. That's so that you get all things English, literary and grammatical on this channel. So, science. It's really a war of two minds in this novella. We've got Lanyon, who's described as rational with narrow and material views. And we've got Jekyll, who's much more aware of the transcendental. And what we mean by that is this idea of the almost, well, mystical or supernatural. And at the heart of understanding this theme, we have to understand their relationships with science because each of them has a totally opposing attitude to science, but their devotion to their passion and fascination with science is at the heart of how we understand the plot as it unfolds. It is their passions that forces their friendship apart, but it's equally their passions that in many ways get ripped back apart when we consider why Lanyon dies on the spot how Jekyll is moved beyond the rationality into something that seems almost mystic and transcendental. So why does Stevenson present them and this theme in such a personal and at points abstract way? I suspect he's flagging the struggles and strains with science. He came from a scientific family and his father, in fact, wanted him to be an engineer. Maybe there's some personal beef in the game. But equally, the language he uses to describe the supernatural moments is both abstract and poetic. So it adds this sense of urgency around us trying to fathom what seems too difficult to grasp. Too many terms that seem bewildering and mesmerising. But there's some context that we need to keep in check that can very much support us in understanding why Stevenson chooses to concentrate so much on the theme of science as he delves into his text. Well, Darwin in 1859 released his theory of evolution in The Origin of Species. And in that text, he lays out his manifesto about the power of natural selection and how organisms evolve into others. So there's a sense of understanding something more than the mystic notion that God has a plan. Science is now laying claim to the idea that organisms evolve so that the best qualities and features of an organism survive, whilst natural selection means that those weakest elements and most withering qualities of a species die out if they are not strong enough to survive. But we should not underestimate also that the Victorian times see huge advances in chemistry and biology and what we consider now the science of those studies when we're looking at the science of drugs called pharmacology. And alongside that psychology, the study of the mind emerges in the 1880s. But alongside that, we also have graphology. And I have in the bottom left of this slide, the study of handwriting itself was something that Victorians were really fascinated in. And whilst this would be seen as a kind of fake science, it would be looking into the idea that you could study someone's personality through the way they chose to write. Now today, we don't see this as a credible science, but you can see in the annotations I have on the bottom left here, how intensively we could scrutinize handwriting to unpick an individual's character. And finally, perhaps most chillingly, was the equally false science of physiognomy. The belief that you could look at someone's physical features and appearance and see their character. As you can see here, this was considered to have a sliding scale in the bottom middle picture between what a most intelligent individual looked like and a least intelligent person looked like. Within all of these differing elements of science and its powerhouse of um, moves forward. Humanity is asked questions that they need to reconcile about the ethics of science and to what extent science is the answer. 
And so as we consider the unpacking of the friendship between Lanyon, who seems rational, and Jekyll, who seems, well, at points caught up with what seems supernatural, we have to consider the power with which their passions are played out and equally what it means that we never get to the heart of why they aren't friends because of some sort of strange scientific dispute we never understand. The specificity of this dispute, because it's never unearthed truly, is even more mystical to us as readers. For example, in chapter two, Lanyon describes the differing opinion he has with Jekyll as unscientific balderdash. This is in direct reference to exactly what's wrong, wrong in the mind with Jekyll. And so there's a lack of scientific detail that accentuates the kind of both personal and the intellectual that's at stake between both he and Jekyll. Balderdash just means nonsense. And so I think if we're looking at science, we would expect facts and pragmatism from the very Lanyon. But instead, we're given some very vague and tenuous links. Now, when we hear about how Jekyll is described, he is described as an ignorant, blatant pedant by Jekyll in chapter three. Hurling so many insults about Lanyon seems so loaded and those adjectives, it seems so harsh, ignorant, blatant. And if you're a pedant, you're fussy. Well, it seems far too personal to be based on fact. So is part of what Stevenson's suggesting to us that science is masked by people's opinions of science, that they put forward their principles of science, but in actuality, it's all about their own personal opinions and what they choose to advocate. So much of this particular novella seems concentrated on scientific fact that's actually posed, moreover, as opinion. So where better to see the mystic elements of science as laid before us than in chapter 10. The reveal from Jekyll of the power of science as it takes over his body with the potion that transforms him from Jekyll, well, to Hyde and back again. The descriptions of the trembling immateriality, the mist-like transience, is full of spiritual jargon that's mystic. The image of the mist-like transience accentuates the power that such a transformation has. The adjective trembling alongside immateriality adds even more intensity to the impact it has on his body. And as if that was enough, the image of a fortress of his identity that is shaken, shook the very fortress of identity. The verb shook accentuates the violence and aggression of this shift, the power of the potion. And very pushes forward the idea that all of the frameworks of the body are shifted and altered just by the power of the potion. So science does, although in its own abstract and seemingly poetic way, hold power. So much power, in fact, that we are not eligible to understand exactly how that power works. I wonder sometimes if this is in part because Stevenson struggled to define exactly how this could be plausible, and it's the suspended disbelief of this novella that hooks us. Or if, in fact, we're stuck and how the mist-like transience or the ways in which the very fortress of identity is shook in many ways helped us imagine what could have been and how it makes it seem more real. This is also echoed in the way that we're told that Hyde is so ugly without being given an explicit description of him. This sense that what we don't fully know, 
what we're shown but not directly told does more to stir our imagination than the blunt scientific fact of a description could offer us. Chapter 10's most chilling piece of evidence is the description as given by Jekyll of the potion itself. The drug had no discriminating action. It was neither diabolical nor divine. It but shook the doors of the prison house of my disposition. Forgive me, but the alliteration of the D sound heightens the dominance of the drug. Whether it's discriminating, diabolical, divine, the doors, the disposition. We get a sense that we've got some sort of fight between what was neither diabolical from hell nor divine like the angel from heaven. But it's got so much power that it shook, again, that verb, that violent verb. It shook the doors of the prison house, the chamber that keeps you imprisoned of my disposition. There's a kind of cautious concern raised by Jekyll here that the potion is not directly good or bad. It's not stirred up with heavenly or evil hopes or ambitions. Instead, it takes what the user has as their own state of emotion and it affects the user of the drug to whatever means they need. And so the potion holds power And so I guess we have questions. Is the function of science in this novella to raise concerns to a Victorian readership about the power that we place on science and rationality or of the addictive functions of science to solve our personal woes, much like Jekyll seeks to solve his repressed desires by creating his alter ego in the form of Mr Hyde, starting off with drug use and not being able to manage it? Or is science actually about exploring other parts of the human mind and soul and approach to thinking and considering how we choose to describe what we should be able to define? All in all, Stevenson has a clear agenda to rip apart the notions of simplistic idea and instead to replace it with the idea that we as individuals have choices about how we use the progress and change that science can bring to either generate what's good or to allow what's evil. As we see with the decline of Henry Jekyll, Dr Jekyll or as we see with the villainy of Mr Hyde. And, in fact, the demise of Lanyon, who dies out of sheer shock at what science so mystically seems to achieve. I'd love to know in the comments below what you are thinking about this theme and why it becomes the bedrock of this novella. Why not subscribe to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar for all things English, literary and grammatical?